Buongiorno, benvenuto. Hello there and welcome to City Breaks Florence Extra, episode 4. A continuation, in fact, from last week's episode when we were joined by Andrea Giordani from Feel Florence, so Florence's official tourism website, to discuss many things related to Florence and to the poet Dante, especially in the light of this year, 2021, being the 700th anniversary of his death. I'm Marion Jones. And I do think that before continuing, I better just explain what Florence Extra means, in case some of you are new to the podcast. Florence was in fact the very first city I chose to feature for a City Break series, because I so fell in love with it when I visited. And it inspired me to create a podcast series which would offer all the background history and culture that you'd really like to know about before you visit the city. Or indeed, just if you're interested in European culture in general. And so, 19 episodes followed. But more recently, I've realised that there's always going to be more to say about Florence. Hence, Florence Extra. A bit more content, some updates, and, crucially, some new voices. People who live in, or work in, or perhaps write about Florence, and can bring us all kinds of new perspectives. And today's guest, Andrea Giordani, can certainly do all of that. As you will already know, if you caught last week's episode, when he told us all about his role at Feel Florence, about how the city is celebrating the 700th anniversary this year, lots and lots of events all year long, and he gave us an introduction to the Florence of Dante and the man himself. But when I did the original interview, we actually talked for far longer than was part of last week's episode, because we talked in a bit more detail about Dante's main work, The Divine Comedy. And so I decided to split that part off and use it in its own right for today's episode. Andrea gave us last week an idea of just how very, very famous Dante is in Italy, known to absolutely everybody. But just in case you're not familiar with the Divine Comedy, his main work, let me just give you a tiny introduction before we move on to what Andrea had to say about it. So then, Dante's most famous work, certainly and one which took him ten years to write. A turbulent ten years which he spent in exile from his beloved home city of Florence. So we're talking roughly 1311 to 1321, as being the period during which he worked on it. Okay, so the final result is 14,000 lines long, divided into three sections entitled Inferno, Hell, Purgatorio, Purgatory, and of course, Paradiso. There are 33 cantos in each section, thus 99 in total, and Dante rounded it up 200 with the addition of a prologue. And if it's not too ridiculous to reduce such a work to just a couple of phrases, I think it would be fair to say that it was not only a huge literary success, both in its own time and right up to the present, giving us a wonderful picture of very early 14th century Italy, But it's also a key text for a second reason, that being that very unusually for its time, it wasn't written in Latin, it was written in Tuscan dialect, the language of the street, if you like, how ordinary people spoke. That had the effect of making it much more widely read than it might otherwise have been, and it also spread the Tuscan dialect through Italy and made it the dialogue which became the foundation of modern Italian. If you want to summarise the plot in one short sentence, you could say it is the story of Dante's journey to redemption. So the journey begins in hell, takes Dante in fact through eight different circles of hell, with wonderful titles like the Circle of Hypocrites. He's accompanied by the Latin poet Virgil, but he also meets lots of very real Florentines, people from the Florence of Dante's day, who one imagines were not happy to find that they had been cast in hell. But, eventually, for the second section, Dante reaches the mountain of purgatory, which he has to climb up in order to reach heaven. He's guided here by his muse, Beatrice, Beatrice in English, but he also meets a number of souls doing penance for their sins as a preparation for entering heaven. And then the last section, he does finally reach heaven, where he meets the saints and sees God in all his glory. Andrea talked me through the story in relation to the Plax project. That is, the 33 plaques around Florence, which tell the story of Dante and his connection with the city. You may remember he said last week that you can go on to the Feel Florence website, I'll put the address in the show notes, and take a virtual tour of all 33. 
At each stopping point, there is a quotation from the original Divine Comedy, there's a translation into English, and there's a short explanation telling you why that particular place provides exactly the right context for that particular quotation. For example, the English version of the plaque which you can find at Dante's house reads as follows. I was born and grew up in the great town on the fair river of Arno. And the explanation follows, remember Dante was in exile when he wrote this, and so he's expressing his homesickness for Florence, as well as making sure with the words a great town, that we understand not just its size, but also its great reputation. Andrea has chosen four other plaques to lead us into details of the story. There are two at the baptistery, one from the Inferno section, where Dante again is missing his beautiful hometown, and a second one from the Paradise section, where he talks about the cruelty of his rejection by the city of Florence, the fact that it made him feel like a lamb slain by wolves, and expresses his wish to return to Florence one day and be recognised and crowned with a laurel wreath. Then Andrea goes on to talk about a plaque at the Palazzo Portinari, which relates to Beatrice, Dante's muse, and to one of the later plaques from the very end of the whole work, Canto 33 from the Paradise section, which is a prayer to the Virgin Mary and is one of the very most quoted and well-known sections of the whole work. OK, so all of that by way of introduction. Here then is Andrea himself explaining it all much, much more knowledgeably. I began the interview by asking him if he could give us a little bit more detail on some of the plaques. And here's what he had to say. Yes, I'll choose some of them, some of the most uh, significant. I will start from uh, the baptistery, which is a Dante's topic place, as we said. The baptistery is an octagonal Romanesque building just in front of the Duomo of the cathedral. And uh, with uh, its decorated green and white marble. Uh, and inside, uh, there is a, a breathtaking mosaic in the ceiling. It was right here, by the way, that Dante was uh, baptized. So we find uh, in this area two plaques. First of all, to understand them, I think uh, we must remember the relationship of uh, love and hate that Dante had for Florence. Well, love, uh, because, of course, Florence was uh, his city, his homeland, uh, where he was born and lived for many years. And uh, hate. Hate, uh, especially for uh, those uh, Florentines in power at that time, who exiled him, condemning him to death uh, if he returned to Florence. So I think this is an important introduction for these plaques. So in one of them, uh, he defines Florence uh, with uh, nostalgia, il mio bel San Giovanni, my beautiful Saint John. Because actually the Baptist is dedicated to Saint John the Baptist, the patron saint uh, of Florence. In the other plaque, he, he hopes to come back to Florence hopes to receive right uh, there the laurel wreath, uh, uh, you know, like the, the Latin poets. But as we know, he will never come back because oh he died in Ravenna where he's buried. Mm -hmm. There's a painting in the cathedral, isn't there, of him wearing the laurel wreath, I think. So Very that's good. In, that's imaginary, yes. is it? Yeah, ah. that's a painting by Domenico di Michelino, an artist of the 15th century. But... As I I'll tell you later, probably there are really hundreds uh, of portraits of Dante in Florence, so painting ah. statues, and uh, but it's always represented in the same way. So with the red and white hat, uh, with the laurel wreath, uh, and with the famous aquiline nose. <laughs> <laughs> so it's in the, in the imaginary of everybody. But if you want, I can read. Uh, that the inscript, this second inscription, which is very beautiful in my opinion. I, I just like to read it both in Italian and in, in English, but in this case, uh, I'll go straight to the English version if it's okay for you. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So now we are in the 25th canto, and I'll read uh, the, the immediately the English version. Okay. So, and then we, we have a very short uh, comment about it. 
if uh, ever it happens that this sacred poem to which I dedicated many years of my life, fruit of earth and heaven, may overcome the cruelty that bars me out from the fair sheepfold where I, I, innocent as a lamb, was attacked by the wolves, I will return as a poet with other voice and hair, and I will take the laurel crown at my baptismal font. Gosh, thank you. He sounds really upset, doesn't he, and sad. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Okay, thank you. So that's one of the plaques early on in the walk that we'd see at the baptistry. And I know that later on, there are plaques about the lady that he fell in love with, Beatrice. So can you tell us a little bit about her? Yes, of course. Well, Beatrice, Beatrix, uh, let's say, Beatrice Portinari was his uh, inspiring muse with whom uh, he fell in love uh, when they both were very, very young. We talk about ideal platonic love, typical of the age uh, in poetry. Beatrice died when she was very, very young, probably at the age of 24. And um, this death caused uh, a deep crisis in Dante. And in the Divine Comedy, it's uh, thanks to her intercession that Dante is saved uh, during his long journey. And after the guide of Virgil, she will accompany him uh, through the paradise she was uh, the daughter of a rich merchant, uh, by the way, founder of the most ancient hospital, Florence, which is still exists. She lived uh, just a few steps away from Dante's house, uh, where we find, find a famous plaque on the facade uh, of her house of Palazzo Portinari. The text is very short, uh, so I can uh, read it both uh, in Italian to make you hear the, the sound, the original sound of Dante's uh, language and style. Sovra candido vel cinta d'oliva donna ma parve sotto verde manto vestita di color di fiamma viva. Over her snow white veil uh, with a olive scent appeared a lady under a green mantle vested in color of the living flame. Now, almost at the end of his journey uh, in the Purgatory, at the gates of paradise, Dante has a vision. A vision of a woman uh, who will uh, later prove to be Beatrice. So she's uh, dressed uh, in white, green uh, and red. Uh, and as I told you, the comedy is full of uh, symbols. So these colors represent the three theological virtues. So faith, hope, and charity. And she's also crowned uh, with an olive wreath, uh, which is the symbol of peace uh, and wisdom. Can I ask you a uh, question? Please. Is it a coincidence that the Italian flag is green, white, and red? Or is that linked to this? No, there's no connection. Okay, <laughs> right, just one thing. There's another story, another long story. Oh, okay. <laughs> Probably <laughs> we have uh, in another occasion we could talk about it, but ah, it's a very, okay. very long story. <laughs> Sorry, I interrupted you. Right, back to... No, no, no problem. No, no problem. So uh, let's remember that uh, very often in the, the poetry of, of this period, the term uh, Madonna, which uh, literally means uh, my woman, uh, Donna is woman, was also referred to the beloved, uh, uh, to the inspiring muse of the poets. So we're talking about, of course, mystical love towards uh, the figure of the angelic, idealized uh, woman. Not far, evidently, from the, the real Madonna that we know, the, the Virgin Mary. And actually, some of the most beautiful verses of, of the comedy, by the way, the original title uh, would be this one, Comedy. It would be Boccaccio, an Italian writer uh, of the 14th century, to define it, the divine comedy. But the original title is the comedy. So some of the most beautiful verses of a comedy, as I was saying, uh, is the prayer dedicated to the Virgin Mary, which is, by the way, another Dante's uh, plaque. Uh -huh. 
And uh, if you want, uh, I can read uh, these very, very famous verses uh, for you, both in Italian and uh, in English. Okay, mm. would you like me to read the English this time, maybe? Well, why not? I think it's a good idea. Uh, yes, so I I'll, think so. I'll start to with the Italian. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, so this is the last uh, canto of the paradise. Vergine madre, figlia del tuo figlio, umile ed alta più che creatura, termine fisso d'eterno consiglio. Thou, virgin mother, daughter of thy son, humble and high beyond all other creatures, final product of the eternal wisdom. Tu sei colei che l'umana natura nobilitasti, sì che il suo fattore non disdegnò di farsi sua fattura. Thou art the one who gave such nobility to human nature that its creator did not disdain to make himself its creature. Nel ventre tuo si raccese l'amore per lo cui caldo nell'eterna pace così è germinato questo fiore. Within thy womb was rekindled a devoted love whose warmth germinated this flower. Lovely. Yes, I think uh, that uh, it was important to read the Italian version as well, so you can have an idea of the, the sound, of the rhymes, of the musicality of uh, this masterpiece. I was just going to say that it sounds beautiful. It sounds almost like a piece of music, doesn't it? Lovely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. By the way, it's a good comment, because by the way, Giuseppe Verdi, you know, the famous Italian musician composed yes. uh, a music on these verses. Aha. Uh -huh. Yes. And uh, so if you if you want just a short comment about these verses mm -hmm. uh, and just know why this plaque is there in the cathedral square by the way. Now uh, Dante is here ready for the final stage of his journey and it's here at the top of the paradise that Saint Berden who accompanies him after Beatrice, uh, addresses a prayer to the Virgin Mary. So a sublime prayer that enables then Dante to be admitted at the presence of God. And here Mary is prayed as uh, the mother of the Redeemer, the source of uh, hope and charity. And uh, by the way, the plaque is right on the facade of the Misericordia, the headquarters of the Misericordia. The Misericordia is the, was, uh, but it, it still is the, the Brotherhood uh, of Mercy, founded in 1244, by the way. So dedicated to Saint Mary, Mother of Mercy. And it's evidently the symbol of the Florentines' uh, Christian charity. So that's why this plaque is there. And is the charity still working today? Yeah, as I said, that's the, the headquarter of the, the Misericordia, which was founded by St. Peter the Martyr, a Dominican saint, exactly in 1244. Still existing. And there is also a museum if you are interested. Uh, so you can see the history of this brotherhood, uh, which is very, very fascinating. Right, thank you. Gosh, so we've had a very few of Dante's many, many words. Thank you for reading those. They sounded really lovely. We've had lots of your time already. Can we just have two more minutes to do a very quick little round of questions about you personally and Florence? I always like to ask people who know the city so well, just a few things. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you're taking a new visitor who arrived in Florence, it's their very first morning and they're lucky enough to be guided by you. So where would you take them? Well, first of all, I will take him to uh, Piazzale Michelangelo. Piazzale Michelangelo or uh, another panoramic tower of Florence. Michelangelo Square actually is the, the most famous panoramic terrace of Florence, uh, where you can see the, the whole skyline of the city, the, the, the harmony of Florence surrounded by its countryside the typical Tuscan landscape. Okay, so you get the overview and then you can go on and do some of the detail. Okay, That's lovely. It. What about, of all the places there are to visit in Florence, 
what would your personal favorite be? Well, I mean, there are so many places that I love in Florence, and it's it's very hard for me. But mm. a few steps uh, away from me, Michelangelo Square, there is a lovely, charming church uh, mentioned uh, by Dante. By the way, there is another plaque there, ah. which is uh, San Miniato al Monte. San Miniato is a Romanesque church, uh, so with a typical facade, the Romanesque Florentine building, so like the baptistery with green and white geometrical uh, marble uh, decoration. And uh, usually it's not full of crowds and tourists, uh, so I would really like people to, to discover this jewel uh, that is one of the places on my list for next time because I did not go there. It's always good to have another reason to come, is it not? Okay, mm. supposing you're guiding somebody who thinks they've been everywhere in Florence, is there something unusual that you can think of that you would take them to see? Well, of course, people must see the most important museums, uh, starting from the Uffizi, the Academy, but there are so many other museums uh, which are absolutely great museum like of course Palazzo Vecchio which is seat uh, of the municipality like the Bargello which is the National Museum of Sculpture with many many statues by Michelangelo Donatello another great uh, Renaissance sculpture San Marco with uh, works by Beato Angelico the Dominican friar and painter of the Quattrocento uh, of the 15th century San Marco was my favourite place of all the places I went to in Florence. That's the one I loved the most. That's a monastery, oh, really? isn't it? Oh, yes. The, the, That's the, it. So the very, very good choice. Yes. But I think I read that, there, that it might be going to be closed. Is that true? No, no, it's open. Uh, by, by the way, we recently inaugurated the new uh, arrangement of the museum. So if oh. you come back... Uh, I suggest personally uh, you to visit it because we, we changed uh, the arrangement of the Pinacotech, so the, the hall uh, where all the panels the, mm -hmm. by Beato Angelio are exhibited. So mm -hmm. the cells, of course, uh, are always the same arrangement, but the Pinacotech, so the, the painting gallery, was recently arranged in a right. new way. Ah, something for my list. Thank you. Look, Andrea, you've <laughs> given you have given us lots of your time. Thank you very much. I think that might be a good place for me to stop asking you questions and just so that we can all just enjoy all the things you have already told us. So thank you very much. You're welcome. It was a real pleasure for me. So I hope really to you to come to Florence. Um, yes, I hope so too. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Well, wasn't that fascinating? And what a treat to hear one or two little extracts in the original Italian. The linguist in me loved that, and I hope you loved it too. Lots of ideas there then for finding out more. The Plax project will be there long after 2021 has finished, if you are able to go and explore it for yourself. But if not, do remember that on the Field Florence website, you can do a virtual exploration of all 33 plaques. And coming back to the idea of visiting Florence, I do want to explain a little bit more, some at least of what there is on the two websites that Andrea told me about, because really there's so much useful information, so many great ideas for whether you haven't been to Florence at all, or whether you've been lots of times and need some new inspiration. So to start then with the main website, which is fieldflorence.it, if you do forward slash en, you'll get the English version. There's a useful tab at the top entitled Organise Your Trip. All sorts of information there about accommodation and transport and how to organise guided tours. The next section is called Experiences and Itineraries. And just to pick a couple at random, there's one on a cycle path along the River Arno. There are dozens of walking routes called, for example, a Baroque itinerary. There's one on Jewish Florence. There's one on, I hope I'm going to pronounce this properly, Calcio Storico, which I think means historic football. And if you heard my episode 5 on Santa Croce Church, you may remember that story of the custom which began in medieval times and has continued ever since, of football matches on the piazza in front of the church. 
quite mad, definitely not modern rules. So you can see what variety there is. There's a separate tab called Events, with all kinds of subheadings on markets and the theatre and folk traditions. A good place to pin down what's happening during the period when you'll actually be in Florence. And then there's a section which you might find the most helpful of all, entitled Points of Interest. And it runs to about 80 pages, I think. So a good moment to use the keyword facility. I tried typing in Giotto just to see what happened and immediately up came 10 different suggestions for things I could do if I wanted to find out a little bit more about the artist Giotto. There were some that I recognised, Santa Croce, for example, and the Academia, both of which have their own episodes in the main series, but there were lots of new ones, places to see his work or find out more about him. For example, one called the Casa di Giotto, Giotto's house, introduced as follows. This is the house where Giotto is traditionally thought to have been born in 1267. Visitors are taken on an imaginary tour of Giotto's work, and also there is a reproduction of the workshop of a 14th century painter with illustrative material about the fresco technique. So you can hear just from that that if you want to go a little bit more in-depth on any topic, you're going to find loads of suggestions. And then the second website which Andrea talked to me about is one all about the houses and gardens which the Medici family were connected with, not just in Florence, but in the surrounding area too. The title sounds a bit tricky, but don't forget it'll be in the show notes, and it is villagiardinimedici.it. As you can probably hear from the address, it's in Italian, but as soon as you go onto it, there's an option to swap to English. And this too is just chock full of useful resources. Here's a quote from the homepage. History, art, beauty, culture. Immerse yourself in the poetry of the Medici villas and gardens in Tuscany. I don't know about you, I'm already thinking, yes please. And it goes on to say, Unexpected, hidden and surprising, they preserve the essence of a territory and a family that has made history. So what it actually is, is information about 14 different villas and gardens, which together make up a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Again, it's nice to see that I had actually thought of one of the 14 places for an episode, that being the Bobbly Gardens, actually in Florence, on which there's quite a section in my episode 13 on the Palazzo Pitti. But if you want to explore all or any of the 13 other sites, then this website is the place to start. You can click for information on any of them, and you'll get a little bit of history, an idea of what to see when you get there, and some practical information about times and telling you that some of them are available to visit only by appointment. Lots of sections on this website too, so there are themes like food and drink, where you can read descriptions of banquets staged in some of the villas, telling you in wonderful detail exactly what they feasted on. There's an art and history section, offering, for example, a piece on the hills of Florence and their connection to Leonardo da Vinci, so places where he lived or worked or studied and also a section called Tuscany Before the Medici, all about the Etruscan sites that you can go and visit. So you can search by theme, or you can do it geographically and find out what there is in Florence, what there is quite close by, and what there is in other areas a little further afield. All good stuff. Material for, all oh, several trips at least. So both those websites then, very much worth a look. And that brings me pretty much to the end of today's episode to the end, in fact, of this current series of Florence Extra episodes, although I do think it's an idea I'd like to revisit in the future. For the immediate future, though, I'm planning a little Munich Extra, and I'm looking forward to welcoming some German guests to help with that, and continuing to work in the meantime on the new City Break series, which I hope to launch at the beginning of November. So then, all of that to come, but for the moment, I'd like to thank Andrea once again for being such an interesting and informative guest, and to thank everybody else, of course, for listening, and given the content of today's episode, that simply has to be done in Italian. So not thank you and goodbye, but grazie mille e arrivederci. (laughs) 